We are excited this morning. Pastor Steve is on vacation, and so Greg and Rebecca Sparks will be lo- joining us in worship. So we are grateful to have you guys here. God bless you. Good morning. Let's stand. Let's sing together. This first part you don't know if you're able. Yeah, it's, it's not compulsory. If your legs aren't so strong today, no worries, right? Um, This first part is a chorus that Greg and I just wrote to this beautiful old hymn. So we're going to start with that, sing it two times, and then go right into the right into the hymn. All right, all right. Here we go. I will rejoice. Our God is wonderful. All of the Lift every voice, oh God, you're merciful, unveil our eyes to see your face. Try that one more time. I will rejoice, our God is wonderful, all of the words of your hands resound with praise. Lift every voice, oh God, you're merciful, unveil our eyes to see your face. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the sky, for the love which from Every voice, oh God, you're merciful, unveil our eyes to see your face. For the wonder of each hour, of the day and of the night, hill and veil and tree and fly. Christ our Lord, to you we raise this our sacrifice of praise. Let's do one more verse. For the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above, for all gentle thoughts and miles. Christ our Lord, to you. This our sacrifice of praise. I will rejoice. I will rejoice. Our God is wonderful. All of the works of your hands resound with praise. Lift every voice. Oh God, your mercy. Beautiful. Our 
God is merciful and there are Our God is wonderful. All of the works of your hands resound with praise. Lift every voice, lift every voice. Oh God, you may. What a gift music has been, right? What a gift to help break us out of our everyday our worries and our frustrations. I love these old hymns because they remind us that all of creation is singing. All of creation is praising the Lord, whether we are or not. So when we come together and we gather here, And we allow God, as we surrender to him in worship, and for many of us, we bring these sacrifices of praise, right? We ask the Lord to allay our fears and set our hearts aright to see him for who he truly is. This is a wonderful time to decide once again, is God good? In the middle of all of the things that are difficult, is God good? And all of creation around us, shouts are resounding, yes. I hear my Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin, I left in crimson stain. He washed it white as singing is beautiful this morning. Lord, now No. 
best efforts, our best music, our best words, our best looks, our best money, our best plans, our best government, our best books, our best education, all of our best of everything. It does not compare to even the most simple of your creation. God, we thank you. We thank you for seeing us exactly who we are and calling out to us and loving us. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you by the way we think by the way we talk, by what we do, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. God, have mercy on us, on all of our wanderings, and all of our fits of power and control. God, have mercy on us. On all the times that we actually believe that these little idols that we carry around in our pockets or that we drive in or that we keep in our heads or we check on the computer to see how much of our little idols are growing and can keep us safe into the future. Have mercy on us, God. We admit and we confess right here in your presence that we are nothing. We are nothing without your presence, without your breath in our life. Once again, Lord, to set our hearts aright, bust through every last thing that separates us from worshiping you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our brain, with all of our body. You are good, and 
your mercy is forever. You are good. You are good. You are good. And your mercy is forever. I invite you to go ahead and take a seat if you choose. And as we prepare our hearts for the mysteries and the glory and the blessing and the centering and the solid foundation of God's holy word, let your heart be open to his Holy Spirit, which is already in this place, doing the work that the Lord does, breathing life into dead things. So present all of your lost things, your crushing failures, your disappointments, your worries, your concerns, all those things that remind us every single day that there's a little bit of atheist in each one of us, bring them right here to this most welcoming altar of prayer in his presence. Your kindness leads me to repentance. Your goodness, it draws me to your side. Your mercy, it calls me to be like you. And your favor, it is my delight. So every day, I'll awaken my prayer. Pour out a song from my heart. You are good. You are good. You are good. And your mercy is forever. You are good. God's people say. Amen. Yes, our children are now dismissed for Children's Church. Children's Church is in the fellowship hall right behind the sanctuary if you want to know where to pick the kids up when they're done.
We are excited today to welcome another guest. This is uh, Chris Etop. He is a friend who is an EPC pastor in California, and he was in the area, and so we are delighted to be able to welcome him today. Um, he was telling me this morning that by 9 o'clock, it's usually about 90 degrees where he's from. So I was warning him we don't have air conditioning in here, but, th but to him this feels like air conditioning. <laughs> so we are grateful to have Chris with, it, with us. Let me pray for you, Chris. Lord God, we thank you so much that you are good. You are good all the time and forevermore and everywhere. And we thank you that we can welcome brothers and sisters from far away and trust that your Holy Spirit is at work within them. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would bless Chris today. You would give him an anointing as, you preach the, as he preaches the word of God, that you would speak through him. Oh, Lord, and may all of our hearts be quickened as we hear your word and are called to follow you in obedience. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Chris. Amen. speaker in a church, uh, it's hard because we are all strangers, right? And uh, you don't know me from Adam, uh, so I wanted to give you a little background on me. I am a father, a husband. Uh, I have four children, uh, two boys, two girls. Sorry, I should say two girls and two boys. My daughters are older. Uh, I love being a dad. It's the best part of every day uh, of my life. Uh, I, you know, I get to read to my children at night. And I got to tell you, if you don't read it to your kids at night, I just want to say, do it. It's awesome. It's amazing. Laying uh, right next to them and, and getting involved and engrossed in a story, it changes everything. Uh, I've been married for 10 years. I love my wife. She's, uh, she's my best friend in the whole world. She's great at cooking. Uh, she's great at hospitality. And I just absolutely love her. Her name is Alyssa. Uh, but, you know, I feel like what I should really do here is I should draw common ground uh, and let's just be honest with what day it is. It is Sunday. You are Pittsburgh. This is a football town, am I right? Like this, well, I'm sorry, you are Sixburg, correct? Okay, now I'm going to level with you. I need you to uh, forgive me. We are best friends. Um, <laughs> And that's how it works. The sound guy is always everyone's best friend. Uh, but I am a Chargers fan. Okay, okay no, see, but that's the thing, is I feel like that's neutral ground, right? If I were to come in here and say that I was a Patriots fan, uh, ah. that might change things. But I have a, a, a deal I'll make with you. We are playing the Cowboys. Now, I know they're not your long-term rivals, but you don't like them, is that correct? Yeah, we don't like anyone. So the Chargers will beat the Cowboys if the Steelers will beat the Raiders. Now, the Raiders are our division rivals of ours, so that would be the law of equivalent trade, right? So now we are all rooting for each other, and therefore we're all on the same page. That's perfect, look at that. That's unity in the matter of seconds, and that's what matters uh, in the body of Christ. Uh, I love being outside. Your city's beautiful, it's green. Um, Mount Washington has gotta be one of the greatest vistas I've seen uh, in decades. Uh, I love hiking, skateboarding, swimming, and I'm just going to be honest with you, if it's an activity that an aging millennial can do without getting hurt, uh, that's really what I'm looking to do, but I'm recognizing that I am made of glass and I don't like pain. But let me tell you, there's one thing that's more important about me than anything else. I love Jesus. He's my Lord, he is my savior, and I hope so much for you. My goal in life is to represent Jesus well, not just uh, to those around me, but to any who would notice me. And today, if you just decide that you need to take a nap from this point forward, and that's okay, remember this. I love Jesus, and I hope you do as well. My goal is to get you all to think about how you feel about Jesus, who he is to you, because that question in your life is of the utmost importance. And I wanna challenge you to take a step toward Jesus today. So many of us get used to a sedentary life. We sit at work, we sit in our cars, we sit at home. 
and we are maybe not used to taking steps any longer. And I want to challenge you to take a step toward Jesus today, and I don't know what that looks like, but I can promise you, after uh, getting to know Pastor Carolyn, that her team here will do everything in their power to help you take that step toward Jesus. And it doesn't matter how small or massive that step is, that is my hope for you today. So now that we understand our goal and you might know me a little better, why don't we open our minds and hearts with prayer and then the reading of God's word. Heavenly Father, Lord, today we seek your words, your heart for us, and how you might use your word to encourage and uh, mold this church. We wanna hear from you, not a California boy, but from you, we are here for your eternal, life-changing word. So this morning, we ask for your voice, your word, your will in our lives. It is all about you and not us. In your name, amen. Now our passage this morning is from John 1, beginning in verse 19, if you'd like to follow along. That is where we will begin and we will be finishing the chapter. Now this is John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you a prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of the one calling in the wilderness. Make way, make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent to question him asked him, why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, this is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. The next day, uh, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus... Rabbi, Rabbi, teacher, where are you staying? Sorry. <laughs> Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. 
Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus says, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I just want to say as we begin, thank you for your attention. That was a lot of text. Um, I've heard uh, that the pastors in California uh, have a tendency to preach for about an hour or so on three verses. Well, Pastor Carolyn gave me 32. uh, And so I have bad news. We'll be out of here just around dinner time. But the good news is the Connell breakfast has been morphed into a, 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 a robust lunch, and Pastor Carolyn and her team have got you covered. And, and because I'm new around here, I want to tell you I'm joking, okay? If you're wondering, if you looked over at your spouse and you said, I don't trust him, <laughs> we'll be out of here pretty quick. But in this passage, we've got three people engaged in their faith, all at different spots, right? We've got John the Baptist, who was engaged in this mission before he encountered Jesus. And then we have Andrew, who meets Jesus, and Philip, who meet Jesus, and then Nathaniel, who has to come face to face with Jesus. You know, and, and what I find to be interesting, and to give you some observations, I notice that John the Baptist is given an opportunity to seize influence and celebrity, and yet he doesn't take it. All he has to do is say yes, right? A simple yes, and all of a sudden he is a big deal. Andrew, on the other hand, he's drawn toward Jesus. But what's his chief concern? My brother. The moment after meeting Jesus, the first thing, what does he do? He goes and he finds Peter. Nathaniel, on the other hand, he is letting his world view and his experience dictate what he believes about the Messiah. He hears one word, and his encounter with Jesus is altered completely. He's letting a preconceived notion dictate what he believes about who Jesus might be. And I can tell you that I have been in all of these situations, and I wish I could tell you that I handled them well. That's why I loved our worship this morning. There was, there was a confession, an opportunity to, to put aside our pride and to move closer in our dependence and in and the grace we have been given with Jesus. And I I wish I could handle things with the same grace and wisdom as John the Baptist or or, or as Andrew or have that same moment of clarity that Nathaniel did, but I don't always. And so because I believe preaching is not just about telling you what to think, I want to ask you to think of your life. Where do you want to grow? How do you want to begin to take a step toward Jesus? Who do the leaders and influential people in your life point you toward? Is it to Jesus? Is it to success? How do you represent Jesus to your family and to those in your life? How have you let your past dictate what you believe and how you follow? And as we continue today, those are the questions I want you to think about while we move through this passage and see how these three men responded to Jesus 
and to their environment. Because I think we will find a piece of encouragement or a piece of instruction for how we can do the same moving forward. Check this out. In our passage, we've got a group of religious leaders, of priests and Levites, and even some Pharisees from among them. And they're just curious about John, right? And let's give him some credit from what we know from Scripture. He was a bug-eating, honey-guzzling, bearded man who lived out in fishing villages but vacationed in the desert to baptize people. Now, in their time, baptism wasn't a, a, a spectator sport. It was a personal, individual ritual meant for cleansing. And so to have anybody baptizing somebody else is unusual in and of itself, but to have this bug-eating man doing it is a spectacle, to say the least. But what's fascinating is their leaders were looking for someone that met this description. Odd, I know. But let me ask you, if there were suddenly a remarkably different man or woman that your pastors and the religious leaders in this area were paying attention to, you might be inclined to figure it out as well, right? Now, I'm from California, and in California we have a city called San Francisco, perhaps you've heard of it. Um, and in San Francisco, it's an interesting town because people gather uh, in odd places and do kind of odd street performances. It's not quite like New York where that's very commonplace. And in fact, I would say street performers in San Francisco is not a very high calling. And yet, we have David Johnson and Gregory Jacobs. Well, I should say we had David Johnson and Gregory Jacobs. And they're better known as the world famous, yes, world famous, San Francisco Bushmen. Let me tell you their act. And I can tell in here you've never heard of them. David Johnson would gather eucalyptus branches. He'd go down to the wharf. He'd hide behind them. And he'd scare people. The end. He did it every day. And Gregory Jacobs' role in the, the, the duo is he would gather up a crowd and he'd begin to say, look at that bush over there. Yes, clearly it's not a real bush. It's eucalyptus branches. That's part of the act, right? It's obvious. And, and yet people so absorbed in themselves would be walking along and not paying any attention and he would just shake branches at them. And in the 90s, a simpler time, that was a national news story. People from all over the world began coming down to the wharfs of San Francisco to see eucalyptus branches. Now, I don't know about you, but that does not seem like a wise investment, right? And yet this guy made his living doing this, and he was successful. Two sticks, scare tactics, National news story. I just don't, I don't understand the 90s as much as I'd like to, even though I grew up in them. Maybe you can uh, tell me later. But people were interested in investigating him because he was different. Now, I want to ask you, would you be interested in investigating John? And how quickly would you begin to let word spread about him? Those guys let themselves become a national news story because it, it sprang them forward in their celebrity. And more interest meant more money, right? John, on the other hand, says no. I mean, listen to this. I am not the Messiah. They are giving him the title of the one they have been waiting for. They are saying, you might be our redeemer. You might be our king. Are you that person? No. Okay. Are you Elijah? Are you the one we're waiting for? The one that's going to usher uh, in the Messiah? I am not. Are you a prophet? Do you hear the desperation? Do you hear a group of people searching for an answer? Well, let me tell you something. There were 400 years of silence from when they had last heard from a prophet of God. When they had last had contact. The Israelites are in their promised land, but they do not own it. 
They are captives in their city. They are under a foreign government. They are awaiting the breaking of a long silence and they are hoping for redemption. Uh, they are hoping for a, a shift in power. They are hoping for so much more than they currently have. They want to see their city, their temple return to its glory. And they are hoping and praying for anyone to usher in that movement. They're desperate. And what John says is incredible because in that moment, how many of us would begin to say, maybe? I might be. Why don't you come and follow me and we'll figure this out together, right? But instead he says, I'm not the one you should be paying attention to. In fact, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Someone else is coming and his name? Well, it's Jesus. And he points him out. He redirects all of the religious leaders and even his own disciples, even the people following him. That would be like a, a pastor of a church saying, you know what, go over there, that'll be better for you. Get out of here, go to there. That's, that's, that's crazy. But rather than bring glory to himself, John pointed to Jesus and look what it caused. Look at the direct result. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he just said, look, the Lamb of God. When two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them and asked, what do you want? John pointed toward Jesus, and lo and behold, people found Jesus rather than John. Let me ask you a question. Is that not our goal? What would you rather have? Would you rather have a group of people following Pastor Carolyn, even though she is wonderful and lovely and she has the best spirit about her and she is incredibly gifted in both leadership and guidance for this church, or would you rather have a group of people following Jesus alongside of Pastor Carolyn? There's a subtle difference, right? But it's incredible. We are a people who follow Jesus, and when we point toward him, rather than ourselves, something begins to happen. People notice Jesus rather than us. And if you are going to follow Jesus, you have got to point to him. He is your creator. He is your savior, your enabler, your advocate, and your source of love. Don't you want people to see that? He is your source of life and peace. He is the hope of the world. Not your house, not your car, not your family, not your job. Jesus is the one thing that makes a lasting and meaningful impact to those in your lives, right? It is all about Jesus. And once we realize this, it becomes so much easier to follow him because all we have to do is point to him rather than to ourselves. It doesn't become about knowing the right things or having enough knowledge, it just simply turns into trusting Jesus to do the work. But then we run into our next problem, right? The moment we say, sure, I'll point out Jesus, we notice who we have to point him out toward, right? We notice that it's our family, our friends, our peers, our coworkers, and if I'm just fully honest with you, this is where it breaks down for me. This is where I struggle. I am the only believer in my biological family. My mom, my dad, my three sisters, they could be described as agnostic at best. I remember when I came to Jesus, my oldest sister flew back from college, took me out to yogurt and said, please, please don't become one of them. They ridiculed me. They called me names. They made me feel less than. Please don't be like them. And now here, here I am, right? I'm kind of a Bible thumper on the other side of uh, the nation talking about Jesus. But this is what Andrew does. Look, it says, so they went and saw where Jesus was staying, they uh, being Andrew and, and someone else. And they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard what John was saying 
and had followed Jesus. And the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Now I want to be really careful as we, as we look at these, uh, these passages because I want to point out a few things and I want to point out something that people get hung up on without even knowing. Number one, the most loving statement in this is the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother. I want you to imagine you are face to face with Jesus. Do you want to leave? Do you want to depart? Or are you ready to follow? And yet Andrew is able to tear himself away, not just for his own sake, but for the sake of those he loves to point others to Jesus. And he brings them there. And I think this is where we get mixed up because it says, and he brought him to Jesus. But that isn't a saying of saying that like Andrew said, hey, Peter, check it out. Let me explain to you who he is, what he's done. Let me argue like, hey, here's what they said in Isaiah and Jesus has done this and that. And no, what he did is he actually just brought him in front of Jesus. He let Jesus do the work, but he pointed him out, right? There's no long argument written here. Do you know why? Because there's no long argument that you need to know. One of my favorite questions to ask with scripture is what isn't written, therefore, what don't I need to be concerned with? It isn't written that Andrew argues to Peter. What's written is that he brought him to Jesus. The first thing he does is find his brother. Do you do that? Do you find the one they call wonderful counselor and go tell someone else, I have found the one who listens and who comforts? Do you find the mighty God, the one capable of doing immeasurably more? And do you say, I have found one who has the power to heal and the power to change? Do you find that Prince of Peace and do you find and tell someone, guess what? My anxiety is gone. My hope is restored. I have something in my life. I just want you to come and meet him. And I know what you're thinking. Chris, it's not that simple and you're right. People are very honest about what they feel about Jesus, right? People are very honest about what they think about the church. People are very honest about what they do and don't like. And yet, this passage also covers that. What does Nathaniel say when Philip comes to him? You know, Peter just goes to Jesus, we assume. But when Philip goes out to try to find Nathaniel, his response is, Nazareth? Ooh. What good comes from Nazareth? Do you hear it? He's never met Jesus. He has no basis on which to make this claim. And yet, his past experience is dictating how he approaches the Savior. And we are the same. And to think any differently is proud. Nathaniel is unwilling to come and meet Jesus. And look what, look what Philip does. It's, it's genius. He doesn't sit there and go, well, okay, I get that he's from Nazareth. Yeah, I know that that's not typically a good thing. But he doesn't then begin to list his credentials. He says, fine, come and see for yourself. Prove to yourself that Nazareth is awful. Just come and see him. Philip does not argue. And let me take some of the burden off of you. You do not need to argue for Jesus. Jesus will speak for himself. Through your life and through his ministry and through his word, Jesus has got himself covered. In fact, you're here in a Presbyterian church, so that might mean, that must mean, that you believe that our God is so powerful that he will call back all to those who which he has foreknown, right? Jesus is going to win. That is the message of the Bible. It's not an if, it's a guarantee. Jesus is going to save all whom he has determined. That is non-negotiable. In fact, you can't even mess it up. So when you point toward Jesus, when you invite somebody to come and see, you do not even need to argue what or who Jesus is. You just need to trust that Jesus is gonna handle himself. And it's not hard to do, where you feel like you need to say, okay, okay, shh, 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 
trust me, the, I know this part about Jesus is weird, but like we'll get to the grace soon and it'll be good. We'll get to the love that you wanna hear and that'll be fine. We'll remove the challenge of repentance and we'll get straight to the freedom of grace. No, 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 that is not how it works. In fact, you do not even need to put up a safety net for Jesus. His word will cut, but it will also heal. And you do not need to worry about it. He has got himself covered. Listen, I wanna ask you, I'm gonna read this passage to you. I want you to think, how many words does Philip say? It says, when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me, Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, because you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree, you will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Nathanael is changed. And what did Philip say? Nothing. Do you know why? Because Philip doesn't know Nathanael's heart, and Jesus does. Notice, Jesus knows the exact sentence to take Nathanael from doubting to devoted. Right? I saw you under the fig tree. Who knew that was important? But it was to Nathaniel. The people with hurt in their lives, the people with skepticism, the people with mistrust, the people who do not want to darken the door of a church, the people who don't want to hear from it, you don't know what it will cut to their heart. But Jesus does, and his word will find it. And his word will reach out to them. And in a single sentence, he can change everything about them. It's no longer Nazareth. What good can come from there? It's you. You are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. From worthless to worthwhile, right? No words from Philip. Jesus can handle himself. And so what does that mean for us today? You know, I gave you uh, some, some big questions. What do the influencers in your life point you toward? How do you represent Jesus to your family and to those around you? And how do you let your past dictate what you feel or experience or how you follow Jesus? Those are big questions. And do you know what I find in here? This is the perfect Sunday school text. Do you know why? Do you know what the answer is? Jesus. So if you wanna feel like you really participated in church as you begin to answer these questions, well, who should people be pointing you toward? Jesus, Chris. Who, who should people, uh, you know, who should we be bringing people to? Well, you know, I love Jesus, so I should bring people I love to him. Well, who can handle himself? Well, it's Jesus. And I want you to, to let the pressure wash away from you. Do you know why? Because all we need you to do is take a step toward Jesus and tell, I'll tell you this, people will notice. Follow him a little uh, closer today. Practice obedience. Show your faith. Trust in him and people will notice. And Jesus will speak for himself through his word and through your life because people don't behave that way. You don't need to fill your head up with anything. You just need to take a step towards Jesus. I hope today that if you remember one thing, you remember that I love Jesus and that he changed my life. I hope he has for you and I hope you're willing to consider a step toward him. I'm gonna say thank you. You've been fantastic. Carolyn, thank you for your, 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 your leadership in this pulpit. I, I think it's incredible what you are doing here to know that there are people at home and people here in an age where church is tough, you have uh, endeavored on and it is a testament to your faith and to the leadership you possess. And I just wanna tell you church, you are overwhelmingly blessed by her. And I see you nodding, so I'm really happy to hear that. I'm really happy to see that. Can I pray over you real quick as we close? 
uh, the, the, the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And today, let us recite uh, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. I'm going to add a word, hallelujah, amen.